Oh, condolences to you and the family. I know you all loved your uncle very much, even though you never met him, recluse that he was, but I'm sure you'll miss him. Of course, the inheritance he left you may ease the pain of losing him a bit, but before you can claim it, there's just one caveat. He wants to be sure it's bequeathed to the heir who will put it to the best use. He was a bit of a hermit, you see, and as he was laying in his deathbed, he realized he never took time to enjoy the wealth he'd amassed. So, he's given you all a modest sum and instructed his executor to award the rest of the fortune to whoever spends their money the fastest. This is Last Will of Vladimir Suchi. Sucky? Such e I don't know, it's the name of the game's designer and I couldn't find the pronunciation anywhere. I'm sorry, I'm an uncultured American pig dog. Place the planning and card offering boards in the center of the table, using the side appropriate for your player count, as indicated by the scrolls on the right side. If you're playing with an odd number, you'll also need the supplemental card offering board, again placing the appropriate side face up. Place the round counter on the round one space on the planning board. Randomly place the four modifier tokens on the property market section. Shuffle the events, helpers and expenses, properties, and companions decks each separately and put them in face-down draw piles near the boards where everyone can reach them. Separate the wine-colored special cards deck into three sections based on the number of crowns on the back. Shuffle each section, then combine them back into a single deck with the one crown cards on the top the two crown cards in the middle, and the three crown cards on the bottom. Put the deck near the card offering board. Put the two companion wild cards near the card offering board as well. Make a bank near the middle of the table with the companion tokens, property value markers, money, and player board extensions, leaving room for discard piles for each deck of cards. Give each player a player board and the matching color errand boy figures and planning marker along with a gray action counter to place on your player board zero space. In a two-player game, you'll both also need an extra planning marker, which you can borrow from one of the unused colors. Everyone starts with the same amount of money, which you can determine by randomly drawing one of the last will cards. Dish out that starting cash and return the last will cards to the box. On your first game, the rulebook suggests skipping that step and just starting everyone off with 70 pounds. Each player then draws three cards from the Helpers and Expenses deck and three cards from the Properties deck. The last person to pay for something takes the starting player marker. The game is played over a series of up to five rounds. Each round has five phases. Setup, planning, errands, actions, and the end of the round. Start the round by dealing one card onto each space of the card offering board. The icons on the board tell you which deck to draw from. Some spaces will use the same deck every round, others will change as the game progresses, as indicated by these numbers. At this point in the first round of the game, every player chooses two out of the six cards they were dealt at the beginning to keep and discards the rest face down to their appropriate discard piles. You'll shuffle a discard pile to reform a deck if it's ever depleted. Starting with the player who has the starting player token and going clockwise around the table, each player makes a plan for the day by placing their planning marker on one of the hourglass spaces on the planning board. This determines how many cards you draw, which you do immediately, in any combination from any of the four regular decks. You have to decide which deck each card will come from up front, though. You can't draw the first one before deciding which deck you'll draw the second from. The hourglass also tells you how many errand boys you'll get during the errand phase, the number of actions you'll have in the action phase, and the order in which you play throughout the rest of the round, based on which of the selected hourglasses is the furthest to the left. Planning is a little different in a two-player game. You'll start by placing your extra planning marker to block one of the hourglasses from being chosen. Once you've both done this, then you choose which hourglass you'll be using. In the errands phase of the round, in the new turn order, moving from left to right across the selected hourglasses, players will take turns sending one of their errand boys on any of the available errands, which we'll get to in just a bit. You can't place an errand boy on a space that's already occupied. 
once everyone has placed their first errand boy, those who chose hourglasses that gave them two errand boys for the round will take turns placing their second in the same order. The errands you can choose to have an errand boy perform for you include card offerings, where you'll take the corresponding card from the card offering board. Note that on the two to three player board, there are two spaces that correspond to three cards. The first player to choose one of these spaces takes any of these cards. The second player chooses one of the two remaining, and the last card can't be taken. Player board extensions, where you'll take one of these guys from the bank and add it to the right side of your player board, giving you space to put down another card. You keep this extension for the rest of the game, and the only limit to the number of player board extensions you can have is the number of these tiles there are left in the bank. Property Market, where you can rearrange the four Property Market modifier tokens however you like. We'll get to why you'd want to do that later. Unknown Card, where you can draw from the top of any of the four regular decks. There's a space for each player color for this errand because it's the only one that every player can take once per round. And the opera, where you'll spend two pounds spending a night enjoying some live music. You'll perform each errand as soon as you place the errand boy on that space. Once you've done your errand, move on to the next player's next errand boy until everyone's done with all their errands for the round. Moving on to the actions phase, You'll start by putting your action counter on the space corresponding to the number of actions your hourglass says you get. Then, in the turn order determined by those hourglasses, each player takes one turn using as many cards as they want. You can play cards from your hand, or activate cards on your player board that you've already played. Each card will indicate how many actions it takes to use it, and you'll move your action counter accordingly when you do so. If you don't have enough actions for the card you want to use, you'll have to wait to use it until a later round. Now let's talk a little about what these cards do. White-bordered cards are one-time use event cards. When you play an event card from your hand, you'll spend the number of actions indicated along with the number of pounds and discard the card to its appropriate discard pile. Some of these cards are pretty basic. They show an action cost and a cost in pounds. But some of them also allow you to bring a guest, such as a dog, a lady, or a chef. If you discard the companion card indicated alongside the event you're using, you'll be able to spend a little bit of extra cash. And if an event allows multiple types of companions, you can bring more than one along for the ride. The order in which the companions are listed doesn't matter on an event card. Companion wild cards act as any of the four different types of companions. They're not part of the deck, though. When you use one of these cards, you'll discard it back to the card offering board instead of sending it to the discard pile. Some events also let you spend more actions to savor the experience and spend a little more money. In that case, simply choose one of the listed options and spend actions and cash accordingly. Black-bordered cards are a little different. These cards are played to an open space on your player board. If you don't have an open space, you can discard a card to make room without spending an action, unless it's a property card, which we'll talk about in a bit. The A on the player board indicates that playing a black-bordered card always costs at least one action. In addition to that one action, you may have to use extra actions, as indicated on the top left corner of the card. When you play a card to your player board, you'll put it in the top section of one of the spaces, but once a card is on your player board, you can activate it at any time during your action phase once per round to pay its expense. To do this, you'll slide it down to the bottom slot to reveal the green check mark and do whatever it indicates on the top right corner of the card. Companion cards can be used to make these expenses more expensive as well. Once in play, you can add a companion to a black bordered card if there's a matching symbol in the top right section of that card. To do this, discard the companion card and place a token of that companion's color on that space of the card. And note that the A symbol printed here means adding a companion to the card costs an action. Unlike the white bordered cards, the order matters on these ones. You can only add a companion to a black bordered card if all the companions above it have already been added. Once a companion has been added to one of these cards, you have the option to take that action when you activate the card 
or any of the other available options you've unlocked. Helper cards are also black-bordered cards you can add to your player board. Just like the expenses we've talked about on other black-bordered cards, some helpers can be activated to pay the expense in the top right corner. But some helpers have a section at the bottom that gives you a special bonus that alters the normal rules of play. This privilege is optional, but it can apply at any time, whether the card has been activated or not. The right column on the last page of the rulebook explains what all these helper privileges are. Properties are a little different from the other black-bordered cards, because you can't discard them whenever you choose just to make room for something you like better. Instead, they have to be sold on the property market. You also can't declare bankruptcy, which is your end goal, if you own any property. So, in order to win the game, you'll want to sell all your property first. There are four different types of properties. Mansions, townhouses, manor houses, and farms. To purchase a property in your hand and add it to an open space on your player board, you'll spend one action, as well as paying the price at the top of the list on the left side of the card. If it's anything other than a farm, you'll place a value marker next to that top value symbol to indicate the property's current value. Farms only have one possible property value, so they don't need a value marker. A property's value depreciates by one space on this track on every turn during which you do not activate it. So, when you own property, you can weigh the benefits between activating the card and spending a little bit of money on its upkeep, or simply letting it fall apart so you can later sell it at a loss. When you sell a property, you'll use an action to discard it from your player board and take money equal to its current value from the bank plus or minus the current modifier for that property type, as indicated on the property market section of the planning board. And if you manage to sell it when the property is worth less than zero, you don't lose any money in the process of selling it, you simply give it away for nothing. Once everyone has taken all their actions for the round, you move into the end phase for that round. All players discard down to two cards in their hand. Note, you are not allowed to save a companion wild card for later, no matter how many cards you have in your hand. So, even if it leaves you with nothing, you have to put the companion wild card back on the offering board. All properties that were not activated during the action phase depreciate in value by one notch on their value track. This even applies to properties acquired during this round. If the value is already at its lowest, it stays put. Reset any cards on player boards that were activated to their starting positions, covering the green check marks. Remove all cards left on the card offering board, except wild companion cards, and send them to their appropriate discard piles. In the case of the special cards with crowns on the back, send them back to the box. Give everyone their planning markers and errand boys, move the round counter down to the next number, and pass the starting player marker to the next player to the left. Then, as long as that wasn't the seventh round, and nobody's declared bankruptcy, a new round starts back at the setup phase. If at any point a player has no properties and tries to spend more money than they have left available, they announce to the other players that they are declaring bankruptcy. They may finish taking any remaining actions to run up a debt, and the game continues until the end of the round. If more than one player manages to declare bankruptcy in the same round, whoever runs up the biggest debt is the winner. If no one declares bankruptcy by the end of the seventh round, the game ends and whoever had the least money left is the winner. But note that in this instance, property is worth its current value plus five pounds, regardless of any modifier tokens or helper cards. Also note that money isn't a secret in this game. If someone asks how much money you have left, you have to tell them. In the event of a tie, the winner is whichever tied player chose the plan farthest to the left in the last round of the game. And that is how you play Last Will. Hey there, my name's Kyle McCarley. I'm a voice actor by trade. You may have heard me as one of these guys. But I'm here to talk to you now about one of my favorite hobbies, board games. I love them. If you like board games, you should check out The Board and Barrel every Sunday night at 7.30 Pacific on twitch.tv slash kylemccarley, where me and my buddies play board games. We also give you guys a chance to help us or hurt us, depending on how you feel, with our buff and nerf house rules. And we have virtual bingo cards you can fill out while you're watching the show. It's a good time. 
Hope to see you there.